Welcome to the second Regional Furniture Society lecture on 18th century Windsor chairs. My name is Julian Parker, I'm the RFS website editor, and this talk is about research, repair and authentic replication. A little bit of housekeeping to start with. The lecture will be followed by a short Q&A. Please put your questions in the chat box. The lecture will be recorded. Please mute your microphone and turn your video off. Uh, opinions expressed during this lecture are mine and subsequent discussions uh, don't necessarily reflect the opinions of the RFS or its members. Please send any feedback you may have or requests for invitations to future events to events.rfs at gmail.com. If you want to join, the address is membership.rfs at gmail.com. Last week, I think I had a slip of the tongue and I said twice gmail.gov, which is obviously an idiocy, for which I apologise. Um, the Regional Furniture Society, very quickly, the annual journal is Regional Furniture, newsletters twice a year, events COVID permitting, and the annual conference we hope to hold in June this year, uh, similarly COVID permitting. Uh, the website is regionalfurnituresociety.org, where you will also find back issues of the journal. The general inquiries email is regionalfurnituresociety at gmail.com. And we do have some grants and bursaries uh, for research, which you can find the details of on the website. And we have at at regional underscore furniture underscore society an Instagram uh, feed and also a Twitter feed at, at Rage Fernsock, who I always think sounds like a rather dodgy gamekeeper. Um, Stephen Jackson is the editor of the journal and he wrote in his introduction to the most recent journal topics include summer houses and institutional chairs as well as church furnishings. The elastic subject of delight to encounter an 18th century chairmaker's dwelling house as, as it is to watch the results of a large scale survey. Close observation is everywhere. Insights arise from understanding documentary source material or evaluating new information by exploring seemingly unconnected secondary scholarship. It was a hard year last year for those of us who do research into dispersed material and archives. Um, and it is worth remembering how often collaboration, dialogue and friendship are involved in bringing such work to a conclusion. What sort of things do we research? Well, the six honest serving men come here, uh, rather handy. The what is British regional furniture traditions, particularly vernacular, and their social and cultural context workshop practices, uses of tools, constructions and decoration techniques. Why? Well, the history of people and objects is both interesting and fun and sheds light on former ages. Uh, certainly for some of us, the thrill of the chase is part of it. Solving puzzles is interesting. And also, um, if you're buying antiques, which don't necessarily have to be very expensive, you're understanding what we're recycling. Um, Time scale. Well, 3,000 years ago, there were three legged stick stools known in ancient Egypt, and we go all the way through to the present. Uh, I suspect we've probably not published anything earlier than the medieval period. Um, and the how is close observation of sources written and oral, and indeed online and in libraries. Uh, where predominantly we study the regions of Britain and Ireland and their influences in, for instance, America and Australia and some other countries, and also, of course, vice versa, the other way around, because the influences uh, do not flow only in one direction. And we're interested in the makers and their lives, sometimes things like their day books survive, the buyers and the users, sometimes they make observations which are enlightening, and the sellers, similarly to the buyers, sometimes bills and invoices are, can help us work out what's going on, as can wills and inventories. And we are eternally grateful to those who compile parish and tax records and trade directories over the centuries to help track uh, people down. 
where might one find these things? Um, museums and libraries, British Museum, the National Museum of Scotland, v &A, British Library. National Library of Scotland has an unparalleled collection of online maps for uh, Great Britain and uh, uh, over a variety of scales and time periods. Uh, People's Collection of Wales website. If I just want to get the first uh, idea about what is known about a maker, I will have a look in British and Irish Furniture Makers Online, the, the website of which is there. Genealogical sites can be very useful. Um, Ancestry and Find My Path both involve subscriptions, as does the genealogist, to which I have recently subscribed. Uh, local history groups publish a lot of useful research. And you can find all sorts of interesting things on uh, antiques websites and dealers and auction house websites. Um, dealers and, and uh, auctioneers cover a wide range of types of objects and things, and they can't all be super expert in all of them. Um, and sometimes they uh, make the odd uh, mistake on their attributions or their... Um, or their history, but they're a very good start and they are always forgiven for infelicities. Um, there are links to other useful websites on the Society website. Nationalarchives.gov.uk has indexes to, to the county archives as well as itself. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff and also stuff that is relevant locally at the London Metropolitan Archives because, for instance, you will find the insurance records of people in Lincolnshire there. Uh, I use Lincolnshire Archives a lot because I live in Lincolnshire and do a lot of research about Lincolnshire, but all counties have one. And the British Newspaper Archive, which also needs a subscription, uh, has many interesting things about furniture makers uh, from the beginning of the 18th century. And you will be surprised how many furniture makers appear in the transactions of the Old Bailey, uh, either as mostly witnesses, but occasionally defendants. Uh, I'd like to thank William Sargent, Tim Garland, Rob Lee, John Bowden, Jeremy Bate, Christopher Pick Vance, Robert Williams, Tom Housley and David Halston, all of whom have kindly helped me with finding things and provided material which has gone into this presentation and I'm very grateful to them. So what is the RFS ultimately about? Well, it is collaboration, dialogue and friendship. It's people who love old furniture and are interested in the people who made and decorated it. And you might be just have a general interest or you could be a student or restorer or a maker or dealer or curator, collector, academic. And uh, quite a number of us have a number of those hats. Um, so on to the chairs. A reprise from last week. Uh, this is the Newark number no. one chair, which was uh, found in a rather sorry state. And we can see that in this photograph taken by Tim Garland, who restored the chairs um, for William Sargent, there is a, a large uh, crack in the back of the seat. And the chair is all of ash. This was its companion, uh, the Newark number no. two chair. And that, as you can see, has got uh, uh, or had a corner entirely off it with woodworm and a split there causing the leg to fall out. Um, quick revisit to the anatomy of the chair. The crest rail is wider than the seat. Uh, it is decorated with scratch stock groove mouldings and there is a little shoulder at the end of the crest rail. The sticks fan out slightly under the crest rail and they are mortised through the arm bow and wedged from above. The proportions above and below the arm bow are 58 to 42 uh, and the there aren't any shoulders on the arm bow. This one is a single piece of steamed ash. Some of the chairs that I will talk about this evening have uh, three pieces of wood and that they, they have a little shoulder uh, at that point on the chair, as you will see. There are three short sticks 
uh, on each side on the underarm and also the these sticks the long sticks and indeed the short sticks are tapered in such a way that the arm bow is assisted in maintaining its correct height uh, which is a clever bit of design and the underarm stands are blade shaped the seat saddle is scooped out and the seat front is curved look at that beautiful swirl and the rounded seat is made to look thin it has groove molding which goes all the way around the perimeter and the arm stand is not pegged some of these chairs do have pegs in the arm stand not these models uh, and the seat edge is chamfered the legs are widely splayed and they are decorated with turned alternate raised and lowered cylindrical turnings and the legs there are mortised through the seat and wedged and this is chair that came from sorders and again all parts are ash uh, quick revisit to the dimensions uh, just under 29 inches at the top it's down to 19 and a half at the waist and just under two feet at the seat 16 and a half inches front to back of the seat nearly 45 in in overall height and the seat is just about two and a half inches at maximum depth and the height of the scoop is just under 18 so the leg height either side of the scoop is probably about 17 inches this is the underside of the uh, Newark number one chair during the course of restoration and uh, Tim heated up the uh, screws to take one out and have a look at it and it's an old screw which was what he thought it was um, and we can see lots of uh, beautiful green paint that gets winter chair collectors jolly excited and on the inside of the left hand blade of that chair there is stamped three times the initials HH and there is a photograph of the whole of the underside of the seat and you can see at the top there there are three plates and then another uh, iron plate that goes curves all the way round to hold that big break in the seat in place and you can see what a fine uh, underside there is there's the curve for the saw and then the ads would have been used to take out the sides either side of that scoop and I think it's a photograph of that part of the um, uh, underside of the chair looks as though it may have got a bit blistered in the heat at some point that is this chair from above and you can see there are the three HHs on the blade and there is a fourth one a fifth one a sixth one and a seventh one and having consulted uh, Tim and Rob Lee and William uh, they are collectively of the view that this must be done with a brand because if you tried to whack HH with a with a with a hammer or mallet and a stamp into the, the blade it would just break the wood and break the blade uh, so the suspicion is that those have been branded in um, I've cropped this photograph so that the cresting rail is in a straight line as it were subject to its curve and it shows that the whole chair over more than 250 years has twisted itself um, and the front of the seat is no longer parallel to the back of the crest though I think if you sit in it you don't really notice um, so on to Newark chair number two which arrived with an old patch that you can see there as well as its uh, debilitated uh, left hand side right hand as we look at it and there we can see that when Tim pulled it apart 
uh, some pleasing green paint on the end of the stick there uh, this oh and it is an ancient nail indicating that this is a, an old repair uh, which has uh, been nailed from above down into hold that bit that is now uh, sitting on the rest of the seat uh, to secure the mend but the seat has split uh, around the top of the chair leg and is in a parlour state as we can see. Tim took this photo just because he was very impressed by the depth of the scoop on the seat of the chair and that's, that's an inch and a half um, that he's uh, showing there and then there is a rather splendid shot from underneath the chair and you can see some uh, red reddish brown underpaint and some uh, more some later green paint uh, and all in all not in a fantastic condition but after Tim had worked on it um, it's got a new patch to hold it together there um, from I think some ash provided by William from his own uh, collection of pieces of ash uh, and Tim deliberately didn't try to, to match it in because uh, to make sure that everybody knows that that bit is a repair um, but it's coloured into uh, to, to, to fit and uh, in a much better and more stable condition it finds itself so that's the pair of them after they have been restored so what's the connection to Lincolnshire why do we think uh, what, what's been going on in Lincolnshire in early days the earliest reference to turning in Lincolnshire that I've been able to track down comes from the whole book of Grantham uh, during the interregnum and in 1646 Humphrey Hipworth was uh, accused of using the trade of a turner not being a freeman and he came and said, do you know what, I served my apprenticeship with John Funton, so free with this borough. And uh, Humphrey Hipworth was baptised in St Wolfram's in 1618 and John Funton was baptised at Great Gonaby in 1571. Great Gonaby is a, a mile outside uh, Grantham to the north, uh, possibly a tiny bit further. And he was buried in St Wolfram's on the 28th of April 1642 so those are the earliest that's the earliest turning that I can find obviously we don't know what they were turning but some of the skills were in the town at that point who might be the maker of some of these chairs William Sargent published an article in RF 2018 Joseph Newton wins a chair maker of Lincolnshire which will shed some light and the story starts with an advertisement in the Stanford Mercury on the 1st of July 1725 and because that isn't necessarily terribly easy to read I have transcribed this and colour coded it for you and it says this is to give notice to all gentlemen and others that have a desire to furnish themselves with new fashion winter chairs so they're new of the best sort may be furnished by Joseph Newton the maker living at Fenton in the parish of Beckingham four miles from Newark and there is a chair to be seen at the White Hart in Newark for example and one at the Angel in Grantham and he proposes to deliver them at these places at seven and sixpence per chair and at Lincoln at eight shillings with as much speed as possible after notice so in 1725, we've got one village maker, two samples, two prices, two towns, and one city and six months carriage. Here's a map of the local area. There is Fenton. Uh, there is Newark. And there's the River Witham, which is in the middle. There is a track where, at a four where you can get across at Barnby and the Willows. Uh, and there may have been a bridge over the Witham at that point. Otherwise, uh, to get to New York, you had to go up to the main road and along that way. Four years later, or nearly four years later, on the 8th of May 1729, uh, Mr. Newton advertises again. 
and he says that Joseph Newton of Fenton, four miles from Newark, maketh all sorts of Windsor chairs. He has extended his range. And the price of the single chairs is seven and sixpence apiece, like last time. And the seat two, seat threes and seat fours, all at seven shillings a seat. So you get a discount for extra. And they are to be sold at Mr. John Fox's gunsmith in Grantham, Mr. Taylor's at the Reindeer, and at Mr. John Farrow's both in Newark and at Mr. John Shackleton's in Nottingham. And a gentleman that has a desire for any of the said chairs may be furnished at any of the above said places. They may go by water from Newark to Nottingham, Gainsborough or Lincoln for threepence a seat. I have furnished a great many gentlemen gardeners with them and they are esteemed above those that come from London and for both ease and fashion. Very interesting that both gentlemen and gardeners get mentioned in that because it gives connotations of outside. Um, and we have there one village maker, all sorts and four variants, two prices and carriage, four named resellers and three towns and two cities. So it looks as though Mr. Newton was doing some business. How does that all fit together? This is a map of Lincolnshire and the adjacent counties showing the principal navigable rivers, which we will name. So there is, there is the Trent and the Fosdyke, which has probably been there since the Roman period, which links it to the Witham at Lincoln. And the Witham has two tributaries, the Bain from the north, uh, which rises just a little way out of Louth where I live, and the Slee uh, from the west. And then the Trent has got the Derwent from the north, the Tame and the Soar from the south. And then in the east we have the Welland going through Stamford, the Neen through Peterborough and the Ouse coming up from Ely and Cambridge. And that is a Thames barge of the type that might well also have been plying the Trent and indeed these uh, rivers in those days. That is the first quarter of the 18th century route of the Great North Road, carefully plotted. And there is Fenton, where Mr. Newton lived and worked, Newark, Grantham and Lincoln. So those are the places mentioned in the first advertisement. There is Mr. Newton himself and the, the angel at Grantham, the white heart at Newark and extra six months carriage to Lincoln in 1725. Four years later, John Fox has appeared to help in Grantham. John Farrow and Mr. Taylor at the Reined Deer. And in Nottingham, John Shackleton uh, for extra thruppence. Also applicable to Gainsborough and to Lincoln. We'll see in a minute why I put Newstead Abbey on the map and also by 1756 Epworth up north of Gainsborough just a little bit away from the trend. So Mr Taylor at the White Hart in Newark appears in an advertisement in the Mercury in 1717 as uh, somebody who had taken a bit of stolen a uh, lost, lost property um, and John Joseph Newton makes his chairs available there in uh, 1725 and at Mr Taylor's at the Reindeer in 1729 and I suspect that the reason for that is that he moved pubs. Uh, who is John Farrow of Newark? He is a joiner who appears in the apprenticeship records taking as his apprentices George Lorimer in 1718, Thomas Hewitt in 1725. John Shackleton spelled many ways, joiner of Nottingham, was himself in 1715 apprenticed to Edward Storer in Nottingham. And then by 1723, he is taking apprentices. He takes William Reddish, Matt Newham in 1725. And then 
1730, John Wharton, and if we look up here, there is John, son of Robert Wharton of Brent, Lincoln, and is Brent, Brent Bruton, which is only a couple of miles from Fenton, where Joseph Newton is. And the answer is yes, it is, because in the parish register, on the 17th of February, 1716, is baptised one John Wharton. Um, and so, fairly clearly, uh, there's uh, one suspects that uh, Mr Newton may have been the person who recommended uh, John Wharton to John Shackleton. There's a couple of other things about Shackleton that I'd like to explore, not least his will and, uh, and uh, a bit of property in the Nottingham archives, but I've not been able to get there because of coronavirus. The next known advertisement referring to Windsor chairs was placed by John Brown in the Craftsman in April 1730. This advertisement is often uh, wrongly dated to 1727 because of an unhappy layout in uh, Ambrose Hill's book, but I have had it checked and it is April 1730, so it is later than both of Newton's advertisements. And Mr Brown is uh, in London at the Three Chairs and Walnut Tree in St Paul's Churchyard. He makes blinds of various types uh, that he's very proud of. And for the spring season, all sorts of Windsor Garden chairs of all sizes, painted green or in the wood, may be furnished at the cheapest rate. Uh, so he sold a breadth of goods. Um, and it would be a bit surprising if he made the chairs himself, but it's it's possible, though I think unlikely. Why did I have Newstead Abbey on the map? It's because, uh, if you remember last week, Nancy Goyd Evans' uh, Splendid Article in Furniture History in 1979 uh, mentions that after the death of William Lord Byron in 1736, and I think the inventory is dated 1738, uh, there is a, an inventory of all the furnishings at Newstead um, and there are ranged throughout these areas no less than 10 settees and the account reveals something of their placement in these passages and here we have in the Red Gallery four double Windsors and a treble and in the Great Gallery four treble Windsors and six singles and in the little gallery, four singles. And in the blue gallery, a treble and a single. And it's interesting that the terms in which they are written in the inventory are really quite similar to, uh, and indeed the models are quite similar to what is uh, found in Joseph Newton's second advertisement with his seat two, seat threes and seat fours. Um, and uh, I wouldn't want you to miss uh, in the inventory that in the Great Gallery there was also an elk's head and a wooden bagpipe. Uh, and let's hope that uh, they enjoyed sitting on their Windsor chairs uh, listening to the bagpipes while the elk blocked its ears. Um, Newstead isn't, it's 20 miles from Newark, 27 from Fenton, 12 from Nottingham. There must be a possibility that. Uh, there are many Windsors came from Joseph Newton. He's a leading candidate and he is probably their nearest source of supply. Uh, carrier from Fenton to Newark and barge along the Trent and carrier for the last ages of possible route. I did, of course, ask Simon Brown, the curator at Newstead, because uh, I was all ready to go and look for the chairs. But alas, the fifth Lord Byron sold the lot, even the doorknobs, to service his sizeable debts. So there's no point in looking for it. What's going on in the Thames Valley at this point? Well, the previous earliest advertisement for Windsor chairs in, in the Thames Valley that is well known and well attested and published is that of uh, Mr. William Partridge in the Oxford Journal, 1754. And he's opened a shop at the White Lion, near the White Lion in Banbury, selling all sorts of things. And amongst that lot, he has garden seats, Windsor and forest chairs and stalls in the modern Gothic and Chinese taste. And uh, again, a, a splendid list, uh, but he may not have been the maker. Uh, what do we know 
uh, of the end and the dates of Mr. Newton, well, there is uh, the entry in the burial register uh, of uh, his um, 1st December 1752, and his will was proved in the, on the 8th of October 1753. And we can see on there that uh, he signs with a rather beautiful florid J as his mark, uh, not a cross, unlike the witness over here, uh, Susanna Wadeson. Uh, that rather elegant J leads one to suspect that uh, Joseph Newton, at the time he made this will, may just have been feeling feeble, but that he could probably write and may have been literate. You, you can't be definite about it, but uh, may, I look at a lot of wills, and mostly when somebody's illiterate, you just get across. Um, the chairs that fits best with the possibility that Newton may have made them are the V&A chair, the Newark chairs, the Sorders chair, the Wren Library Lincoln chairs and the Epworth chairs. Uh, here is one of the Epworth chairs, which is the one that's got the plaque on it that says First Methodist Pulpit at Branston, which is a little bit down the Witham from Lincoln. Uh, and this one is distinguished, uh, obviously it looks very similar to the New York chairs and the V&A chair, but it's the first one that's got turned under arm supports as opposed to the shaped blades. And then we have uh, the Epworth Old Rectory chair that uh, has on it the plaque. This was used by the Reverend John Wesley in 1756. And that has the saddle scoop and it's the first in this group of chairs that has got uh, an H structure. And of course, uh, Epworth is four miles from the Trent at Oston Ferry, a bit north of Gainsborough. Over to the Wren Library at Lincoln. This is the Wren Type 1 chair, which uh, we'll see a bit more of. Them. I've got some more photographs of these chairs that weren't in last week's presentation, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And that is the Wren Type 2, which is the one with the pad feet and the slightly straighter uh, crest rail. Here is some photos taken by Tim Garland of the Wren Type One, and there are there's the lap joint because this is not these are not made with steam bent uh, staves. They are made of a number of pieces which are pinned with dowels at their lap joints. Here is uh, a Type Two with uh, some elegant dowels over the top of the lap joint. Sticking on the Wren Type 2, uh, Rob Lee pointed out to me quite how elegant and clever that little uh, thin turn chamfered ring is, and also a little bit of incised ring decoration there. Um, there's another shot of the Type 1, and you can see the lap joint very clearly and the dowels either side of the stick. And also on the Wren Type 1, you can see here the elegantly shaped crest rail with scratched moulded grooves on the going across. And there's a square pin in a round hole holding that stick in place. Staying on the Type 1, that's the shot underneath. Uh, we've not been able to get into the Wren again to see these chairs and have a Another thing about what the wood might be, but uh, Tim has a suspicion that that might be uh, some form of pine, but we're not sure. Um, and what you can see clearly in that photograph is the curved mark of the saw, which is the peak of the scoop. That's a close up of the pad foot of the Wren Type 2, looking uh, jolly elegant. And there is the underside of the seat, and I've just overlain a 90-degree uh, white line to compare it, uh, that curve mark, with the Newark number no. 1 chair. It's got the same size. So that just gives you some sort of feel for 
how much bigger the scoop is on the outdoor chairs as opposed to the indoor chairs. There is the Rentite one next to the new number two chair. And last week I showed uh, some of these chairs. This is uh, one that I have that came from uh, Pete Bundy and Ross on Y. And it has the Gothic Pierce Smash Buff um, Steam Horseshoe arm. And Tim Garland very kindly replaced the Crescens, which had long gone on that. Now, Thomas Crispin, though he didn't put it in his 1992 book, thought that these uh, Gothic Chippendales Black 18th century comb mats came from Lincolnshire. And that comes to us, uh, Mike Wakelin. Uh, he told Mike Wakelin, who told William Sargent, who told me. So we know what the chain is, but alas, we don't know what the detail is on why he thought that. Um, all these chairs have legs mortised through the seat and wedge. The sticks are also mortised through both the seat and the arm bow and wedge. The crest rails are all pinned with wooden pins. The Lincoln and Atworth chairs are amongst the earliest to have cross and side stretchers, which are missing all the others. One consistent difference between the possible Newton chairs and the Gothic's black versions is that the latter lack the sculpted seat. They have a flat bottom and a less pronounced saddle. So whether they or not they were in Lincolnshire, they have a different feel and the design influences are, are a generation later than Newton. Um, and if there were winter chair makers in Lincolnshire after Newton dies and before Nicholas Allen emerges in Boston in the 1790s and Roger Taylor at Grantham, um, also in the 1790s, but we know he's making Windsor chairs at that point, um, we don't know where or who they may have been. Um, side chairs. Uh, this is taken from Michael Harding Hill's book just to show uh, mid 18th century Thames Valley comb back side chairs. You've got a simple crest, you've got cabriole legs, pad foot, and eight stretcher with a fantail and a couple of sticks to join the crest rail. Similar sort of design for this pair, also from Michael Harding Hill's book, uh, showing the uh, cabriole leg, the eight stretcher, uh, a vase splat, and the rather elegantly shaped crest rail, and uh, the same fantail with two sticks. But what is this chair? Well, we think this may be possibly the oldest wizard side chair ever identified. Uh, it has got a Wren Type 1 cresting rail. It's got the saddle seat. It's got Wren Type 1 rear legs with the raised and lowered cylindrical turnings. It's got Wren Type 2 stretchers and the pad feet. And, the, and the, the, that's uh, a combination of everything, as well as obviously a vase splat. And this uh, came from Robert Young Antiques and uh, is now uh, part of William's uh, collection at the Lincolnshire Chair Museum and uh, taken from behind you can see the single stick that is used to link the stabilize the fan tail to the crest rail and there are five wooden pins which hold the splat and the four sticks in place. The seat is worn up, which is quite rare in Windsor chairs, and it has the sculpted edge. Turn it through a side profile, and there is a single stick at 90 degrees on the fan tail that gives a single fixing point that makes the framing of the chair easier. Rob Lee uh, pointed this out to me and he also pointed out to me that um, the splat side of the single stick is shaved flat so that it fits tightly to the splat and he says if you're making something like this when you've got that arrangement in place first it makes the framing of the other sticks on the crest rail a lot easier. There was only one side chair and William had it, so I uh, needed one too. And uh, fortunately in Lincolnshire, 
there is a man who can and here is uh, Rob Lee who uh, is standing outside his mud and stub workshop in his wood uh, Rob doesn't favour power, to power tools unless he absolutely has to use them and that chair that he is standing proudly next to and justly proudly uh, is the one that he made for me to be a replica of Williams and uh, as you can see he's done an absolutely fantastic job the only difference between them is that uh, he thought it would be better to do um, an elm seat than a walnut seat and so he did um, what sort of tools does Rob use well uh, I found some months ago this rather splendid volume by Thomas Hennell, who was a, a fine uh, artist, who published a book just after the war of um, all kinds of artisans at work and their workshops and tools. And here, from his Windsor Chairmakers workshop, uh, the set of tools, and you can see the, the, the auger, the ads, uh, Turner's axe various travishers and uh, scrapers of various forms and sometimes those are called bottomers adzes sometimes the turner's axe is called coachmaker's axe more tools the bit down the bottom and the chest bib for uh, breast bib for using for the screwdriver or the stock of the, of the brace and bit um, and then a bow saw for cutting up whatever you want to cut up with it he also shows a half assembled chair with the legs and stretchers in place but the holes drilled but not yet framed for the rest of the chair and then the components there's a cramp for holding things in place on the workbench and hoops and arm bows in varying states of uh, being stressed and bent and down the bottom here the former which goes on the bending table and then there are pegs that go on the bending table that hold the uh, arm bow or the hoop that you're bending in place here's Rob's own uh, versions of those tools his carpenter's ads his bottomers ads uh, his fro and mallet for riving the trunks and branches and his turner's axe uh, a couple of his hand augers and a brace and bit and then here we have his scratch stock some travishers and some spoke shaves and down the bottom here a draw knife so there are the travishers and there are the spoke shaves so if you want to make one of these chairs how do you go about it well the first thing you've got to do is to drop an ash tree and uh, Rob has his own wood in Lincolnshire and uh, has very kindly made available to me uh, a sequence of photographs and videos that he and uh, his daughter have taken of him uh, making uh, a chair or various chairs. So drop it and then rive it in a break and this is the break there are there you can see there's two cross members there it's sort of a frame and as you'll see in a little while uh, you put what you're trying to split in the gap to hold it and there in the next slide is uh, the use of the fro and there is the the a frame and the quarter trunk that's being split in the middle and here is Rob in action. Sort of wine with the, 
and it's growth. Yeah, it's got a slight wind on it, which is to be expected. It's going up a bit there, down a bit here. So it's going straight down the heart without any extra manipulation. Thick at this end. Mm. Mm, it's quite tough. And it's right down from the base of the tree. It's always harder to split down there at the bottom. Right, I just think I'm going to get a little out. So that looks all right now. See how it goes from the book. Um, if I struggle with it, I'll do it the opposite end with the other piece. So what I'm doing, I'm going to half the mass, different shape, but, um, but similar mass. That's about right. Right, I'm off the heart of it. Looks like it might be coming off a bit there, bottom. So I'm going to turn it round. High pressure down. And even though you can't see it, just about back there. Right. There we go. So it's going off there. And I've fired pressure down and it's gone back in. Put it away. So that actually worked nicely from the butt. So. What do you do when you want to make a leg? Well, here is Rob's photographs of that process. Rive the ash with the fro. Make yourself four blanks, four legs good, two legs bad. And then rough them out with the turner's axe to get the blank as even as possible. Obviously in all of this I am indebted for the both the text and the commentary to everything Rob has taught me. Um, and he then shapes it further on the horse with the draw knife you can see the draw knife dangled over the horse there and you can see that it's starting to head towards uh, something that might be put on a lathe and so the next stage is for it to go on the lathe with a roughing out gouge and a pair of calipers <laughs>
The next phase is with the skew chisel. and finish off with burnishing with shavings. Steam bending. First thing Rob did was to build himself a flexible steel bending brace, here it is, with handles at either end, and then he built his steam box, which is sitting on these A-frames above the Arga, there's the steam box, and you can see the handle to the door at that end, so it's a Rayburn, not an Arga, they're both owned by the same company. Um, then Rob loads the staves onto suspension pegs peg built into the steam box to keep the staves uh, off contact with the sides of the box as much as possible. And then uh, put the steel bending brace on top of the steam box to try and uh, get it as warm as possible while the bending is going on. And then very cleverly Rob uh, brings his pressure cooker to... Uh, steam take the weight off and uh, channel the steam into the steam box and when he judges that it's had long enough to uh, get the ash in a bendable state um, he dashes to the bending table with a hot steel brace and a steam stave and here is the bending table and uh, there is the former which he's had got clamped ready on the bending table and there are, there's an array of pegging holes you can see them there and most of them are full of pegs and these pegs are steel pins that he uses for pinning mortise and tenon joints in the timber frame buildings that he makes and the Brace with the hot steel, the purpose of that is to minimise the splitting. As you can imagine, if you're taking a stave from being straight to being bent effectively at 90 degrees in two different directions, uh, there's quite a lot of strain that goes on, particularly on these parts. And having the hot steel brace, it minimises the stress at the points which are most given to breaking. One does occasionally come across winter chairs where the wood is splitting at the top of the bow for reasons that are understandable and he's now using a, a winch to help him control that process uh, and I'm now just uh, going to show you how he uh, makes the seat and here he is to tell you about it. I've been lent this by William Sargent of the Lincolnshire Chair Museum and I'm going to copy it. I need to check it against 
the original and I'm going to trim up there trim down there actually there more depth there it's not bad that's pretty good And that's what you end up with and then after the legs are in and the holes have been drilled for the sticks it's time to frame the chair and get ready for fixing so here is a chair part framed and Rob reframes and mantle that may be a verb I've invented and dismantle uh, and, and until the parts are in the right balance um, and when he's happy that it will all fit together properly uh, it's time to uh, wedge the sticks via the curves cut in the top of the sticks and the wedges are positioned so the wedge goes at 90 degrees to the grain of the wood so it doesn't split and the most important sticks are pegged with cleft heart of uh, heart of oak, oak pegs of heart oak which is very tough and uh, a multiple faceted cleft peg Rob tells me into a smaller round hole gets a much better grip so once uh, all is ready and the wedges and the animal glue are to hand why animal glue well that's because that's what the original makers used and and it's also soluble so if a restorer needs to take it apart um, it's easy to do so and the paint would uh, protect original glue uh, from the rain when the chairs were outside now, uh, since my friend Tim Garland uh, uh, will probably be watching this talk at some point, he would say to me, appeal to everybody not to use super glue. Don't use nasty modern glues on mending old furniture because it makes it harder to fix when they come to him to be properly fixed. Um, so there is Rob's first um replica which is we decided we call it the research prototype for this part of the talk and there is the mark ii um which i think is now sitting happily at uh at williams place uh so there we have the research prototype uh the mark ii and the mark one and uh, by the time the Mark II's got a bit of age on it, you wouldn't know that it was 270 years younger than the Mark I. Um, and I just thought it was such a beautiful shot of the three of them sitting in the sunshine. There they are. Um, Rob has used elm seats on both of the replicas and the original there has an ash seat. Uh, 
here are the prototype, the Mark I and the Sorders chair, uh, all sitting in Rob's workshop. And uh, uh, the, the next sequence is about how the Sorders chair was repaired and restored. <laughs> it's rectangular. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's actually quite a big thread, you can tell it's an early yeah. one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the yeah, thread, yeah. yes, yeah. It's massive, actually. I think it's before the day of the fish stand of Yes. Am I? No, I'm not. I thought I was tightening it up again. Oh. <laughs> Surely not. Oh, I am. You're that yeah, that was. I was yeah, tiny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> A screw thread dyslexic, I'm <laughs> And after Rob, assisted by commentary from John and giggles from me. Uh, had removed the blacksmith's repairs. You can see uh, what a splendid bit of blacksmithing they are. And uh, they're next to me on the seat as I record this talk. Um, the pole lay that you saw Rob working on earlier uh, is a new one that he made relatively recently and I thought it might amuse you to see why he had to make a new one. And you can also see that the day that we were visiting him, it was raining rather a lot in the wood. Spin on that. You do, you do. And then you do, and then you do. And here we have a regional furniture society member enjoying a day out in his natural habitat. The blacksmith repairs had bent the whole comb out of shape and put stresses and strains in all sorts of odd directions in the chair um, and here's a picture taken in the auction house on the day that I went to uh, inspect and acquire it and you can see by the uh, arrows that I've put on there the degree to which the tight screws here are bending the whole of the rest of the comb forwards um, one of the reasons why I took the decision to do a full repair and restore was that through Williams Newark chairs we had an original on which to base the restoration so we knew exactly what it ought to look like. Uh, I was very lucky because I had a team with the right skills to make uh, the parts that needed replacing so Rob uh, made the new sticks and then Tim made the uh, groove moulded ends for the crest rail and he also did the colouring out of the repairs to match the original. So that this shows the chair returns to its harmonious proportions and intended shape. 
and the next slide shows the before and after and you can see in fact that the, it's bent forwards in the comb with the with the blacksmith repairs in and now that it's got the correct length sticks and uh, the right ends back it's a much better balanced chair um, and that for now was it or so we thought and then very recently there appeared another chair in Bonhams and uh, in the oak sale just a fortnight ago uh, was the chair on the right and when you sit it against the side chair that resembles so strongly all the Wren Library types of Williams um, you, you can see that the chairs are not identical that the shaping of the crash rail is different but they're in the same neck of the woods ditto the splat uh, the legs the rear legs are uh, of cylindrical raised and lowered sections and the front legs are the same except that the chair at Bonhams has lost its toes uh, the pad feet have been cut off at some point and if you look at the different length there and different length there I've not yet got to handle this chair I will soon but I'm pretty sure it's had an inch taken off the back legs to balance it so you don't tip off it forwards because it's lost the pad feet and there uh, David Halston very kindly has taken some photographs uh, so that I could do this comparison um, and there on the left is William's chair and on the right is the one that has recently uh, appeared and we can also see on this chair we had been meditating on we thought the cross stretcher and one of the side stretchers might not be original uh, and now when you look at that uh, side stretcher and compare it with those two uh, and that cross stretcher there it looks as though the H stretcher has survived probably in its entirety on the uh, chair at Bonhams and that that is the replacement on uh, Williams chair um, but you can see very clearly uh, I don't think anybody would doubt that uh, the same hand has been involved in the making of those two chairs and for further evidence here they are uh, taken from a as, as, as similar angle as we could arrange uh, and you can see the single stick uh, on the fan tail is uh, absolutely identical method of construction with the pins to hold the sticks in the rail and uh, scoop of seat and scoop of seat that you can see it's not quite at the same angle but uh, there would be a gap there if it was at the same angle um, and that one as I say is walnut that is a very splendid piece of ash and then there is the base of the fantail of the Bonhams chair and there is its uh, undercarriage um, very splendid bit of scooping and rounded tops to the legs which you can see better actually in the next photograph you can see how round they are before they go into the seat and then here we have the bottom of William's chair on the left so that's the walnut chair on the left and the, the ash chair is on the right and this is a very interesting view because it shows us that uh, whoever was making these chairs was developing their thoughts on uh, the best design and the best shaping and whilst obviously one can't be certain about it one might think that uh, the person who made that seat was not quite as it might be the same person but by the time they get to making this one uh, look at the skill involved in the chamfers around the edge and it's uh, it's in the same school but it's it's got a, a different execution and uh, what a splendid thing it is to be able to show both of those together and it also shows the value that uh, sometimes uh, the first thing I do when I look at a Windsor chair very often is to 
turn it over because you get a lot of clues about what's going on by looking under the seat. Well, where do we go next? The records of the Dean and Chapter at Lincoln Cathedral are at the Lincoln Archives and uh, it, it must be likely that the 18th century arrival of the Wren Library chairs will be recorded somewhere. You know, they may have bought them or if they, there'll be a record of the purchase or if they were a legacy or a donation, there are various registers of accessions and legacies and donations. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic has, has, has held us up because we've not been able to get into the archive, uh, but as soon as we can, uh, we will be going through the uh, second quarter and third quarter of the 18th century uh, accounts at Lincoln Cathedral to see if we can spot anything interesting. And we will reinspect when and if we can the B&A chair, the Epworth chairs and the Wren Library chairs to see if we can take this uh, any further. So that is uh, the end of my second lecture and I will finish by showing you the Regional Furniture Society current leaflet and now I think you know why it is that uh, it's got a Lincolnshire Winter Chair on the front and thank you very much indeed for watching.